Hey, before I start this episode, I need to give a shout out to three special people who are part of Numa Plus. If you don't know what Numa Plus is, it's basically my version of Patreon. It's where I share exclusive content, other stories I don't share publicly, behind the scenes stuff. Um, I release some of my episodes, like my interviews, way early in Numa Plus. So if you want to be part of that, you can click the link below to subscribe. But three of these people are subscribed to the highest tier in Numa Plus. They're called Diehards. I want to give a special shout out and a thank you to Becca Ruiz, Pam Jensen, and Brian King. Thank you, all three of you, for being subscribed to Numa Plus as diehards. We so appreciate your subscription and your patronage to me and to Numa. We are really thankful for people like you in the world who support the work we're doing. The rest of you who want to participate, again, the link below will give you access to Numa Plus. Let's get into this episode. Hello, welcome back to the show. Uh, I'm excited to start a new series with you. I want to do a series called Stories of Deconstruction. Um, so less topical, less like talking about specific things that we deconstruct, and more, I want to share certain voices um, who have their own platforms, who have done work, uh, and I want to share their stories, how they got where they are and what they did about it, and why they have the convictions that they do. Um, and I think it's like helpful to hear people share their work and their perspective, but I'm always so interested in hearing how they got where they did. What were the catalyzing events or moments in their process and lived experiences that compelled them on the journey that they're on because none of this stuff is isolated or separate. We are all like, I think it's a really Western thing to try and separate ideas and sterilize the whole thing and like let these things be separate itemized things that coexist when in actuality, these things aren't separate from each other. They're all housed and held together by us. And so our lived experiences absolutely inform our theology. They inform the way we read the Bible. They inform the way we listen to and hear the people we respect and and receive from. So um, to kick us off in this series, I want to share my story. I want to share some details that I've not really shared, not because I didn't want to. They just didn't really seem as pertinent (laughs) to other spaces and times that I've shared about deconstruction in my process. So if I'm doing a series called Stories of Deconstruction, I want to take some time in my episode to share some aspects of my journey that I don't typically talk about. Now, I've been deconstructing for a while. I just didn't know that that's what it was called, right? And I didn't, there wasn't like a movement at the time. Um, And I didn't have like a focused, ardent, relentless deconstruction process until I came out. But before then I was, I was one of those people that thought critically and wanted to hold things like accountable and like weigh them out. And if it didn't like pan out, then we needed to renegotiate. What do we actually believe here? How does this work? What is truth, right? That was always a value and priority for me. So when I came out and then, you know, went on that process, that thinking, that way of thinking and approach was all already there. And so I just applied it to all of this. So let's go back, right, to, you know the story. I came out as a gay person. Um, contextually, though, what happened was that process started in the middle of the lockdown, in the middle of the pandemic. Actually, at the beginning of when we started social distancing and then like quarantining in our homes, <laughs> which remember there wasn't really like an end date in sight. And we were like, how long is this going to be? A month, two months, a couple weeks. And then it turned into what, over a year, however long it was. That was a ride. That was a journey. What a time to be alive in history, right? In that time was when I started coming out. And so I started doing some research. Like I didn't want to just, like I had a couple of options. Uh, I could humanize myself and embrace my sexuality and embrace what I had felt God was telling me for most of my life. And I could have just flipped the bird to the church and evangelicalism and, you know, Orthodox Christianity and walked away and been like, I'm not part of you anymore. I'm out. I'm divorcing from you. Whatever. You've harmed me. You're hypocrites. Like I could have done all that and walked away. I could have. I didn't want to. And I guess that was an option. I don't know that I could have based on my convictions because I still deeply valued the Bible and I still believed in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And saying that now just feels so cringy, but like that was where I was. Uh, (laughs) It's always like, I don't know where we are, you know, who's listening and what part in the journey they're on. And not that you'll necessarily end up where I did, right? And that's one of the interesting variables. And I think one of the beautiful things about deconstruction is we all get to go on our journeys and we don't have to end up in the same place. And yet what we have in common is a willingness to hold our beliefs and our ideas accountable and like regard the harm that they produce in people's lives and continue to do the work, hopefully, right? Um, anyway, so in that process, I was living at home with another housemate. Um, it was just the two of us, and I was having to like 
face the other option I chose, which was to do the work of pouring into theology and like how does the Bible actually support and affirm and protect, protect queer people as opposed to the other thing that I'd been told my whole life. So I started with God and the Gay Christian. I had known about Matthew Vines for a couple of years. I watched one of his videos when I was still working at Bethel and I remember I was actually, this is a story, um, I was working at Bethel, I was in my boss's office after hours doing something else, I forget why I was still there, and then I ended up, I don't know how this happened, but I happened upon a Matthew Vines YouTube video of him preaching at some, almost like maybe Episcopalian church or something, Presbyterian, it was a very like, almost Catholic looking lectern, and he was talking about how God affirms same-sex monogamous relationships, and I was shocked and I was disappointed. I was like, oh, I want to believe what this person's saying, but I didn't feel like his exegesis was strong enough. I didn't really feel like he made a strong enough case at the time. So I felt a little unnerved that I watched that and made sure I cleared my browsing history and like left the office. <laughs> so I knew who Matthew Vines was, right? So anyway, when I finally was ready to start like looking into this, I ordered his book immediately. Um, and before this book showed up, I found Kathy Baldock, Nope, that's not true, sorry. I started doing some research on YouTube and I found a couple of different people, like God is Gray by Brenda Davies and um, John Corvino, he's an atheist who was doing just a, like basically apologetics for why homosexuality can't be a sin, which was really interesting and helpful. But anyway, the book finally came in after all that, so I started just devouring this book and it was so helpful. Reading Matthew Vines' thoughts was so much more compelling and he obviously could just do a lot better job in a book than a 50 minute sermon or whatever. So this like started my process um, and it forced me to have to confront some things that were unquestionable in my upbringing. And he talked about Justin Lee and Kathy Baldock in this book. So I ordered Justin Lee's book, Torn, a, another really helpful book on my queer affirming journey in the theology side. This was more about relationships and communication regarding queer people within church spaces. Justin did a great job. Um, hosting the nuance and at these both both these guys did a great job advocating for gay people they had said things and held like had questions and held arguments accountable in ways that I had never thought of before and it was obvious to me that gap was these guys had embraced being gay and didn't have this shame or this stigma or the internalized heterosexism that I still had when I was reading them and I was so thankful to see that attitude come forward and Matthew Vines pointed out another book called Bible, Gender, Sexuality. This was way more intense when it comes to the, the theology and the context. I got about, I think, halfway through this book when this next book showed up called um, A Letter to My Congregation by Ken Wilson. This is a pastor out of Michigan. I don't necessarily recommend this book because I don't think the conclusion is strong enough. I think that the queer community deserves a lot stronger advocacy and affirmation and allyship. Um, so I, I appreciate that he did this. Um, his... His opinion in here, I think, is basically like a th he proposes a third way. It's not that gay people should be condemned or they should just be embraced. He thinks the third way of this should be it should be unto each person according to their faith. If people in their conscience genuinely feel affirmed by God and their sex homosexuality, then they should be permitted and allowed and affirmed to, uh, to pursue that. And if they don't feel that conviction, then they actually shouldn't. I understand what he's saying. The thing is, the people who can't find conviction to affirm their sexuality and humanize themselves in that, I still see as victims. And so I don't think this book actually does goes far enough to advocate for and do justice for people like that. Um, anyway, so I'm, I was about here, uh, these books, what, these four, in the process. Um, those of you listening to my podcast, I was holding up some books, but alas. Um, in that process, I was realizing like it wasn't just enough to affirm gay people or queer people for that matter. I was realizing there were other things that were coming up that I needed to look at. And especially if I was going to bring my team on this journey, I knew I wanted to bring some friends and my team especially with me in this process, whoever was actually able to come with me. And I didn't know who of them would be able to and how many of them would be left. So there was a lot of variables and question marks in this process, but I just had some vision and conviction for like what the future was going to look like and how I was going to move forward. And I absolutely wanted to bring people with me, like the people closest to me. So I got this book, What is the Bible? by Rob Bell. And of course with Rob, you know, his very approachable, simplistic, stylized, poetic type communication was really helpful. Um, but basically he, in that book, he describes how the Bible was written over like the span of 1500 years by like 42 different authors. It's not a book. The Bible is a, a collection of books. It's a library. 
and that you know it's comprised of a bunch of different kinds of genres and that we weren't ever supposed to read this stuff literally. Um, and he just did a great job debunking and confronting bigotry, ignorance, superstition, and literalism within evangelical culture. Like in Christianity at large, it was like there's so many errors in the ways that we relate to the Bible and what we expect from it. And then in that process, then I actually ended up getting this book called uh, A New Kind of Christianity by Brian McLaren. And this book was a game changer. Um, Brian basically confronts Christianity, exposes a lot of harmful, like the word is bigoted, um, uninformed, unsubstantiated, insubstantiated opinions and perspectives about the scripture and about God and about Christian life. And basically is like, hey, we can't move forward like this. Anybody who thinks, anybody who's, anybody who's educated or is informed cannot accept the tenets and the attitudes and the culture of Christianity the way that it is because of how marginalizing and oppressive it is to people who aren't straight white <laughs> males, right? Basically, he didn't say that in this book, but that's kind of the gist. And I just found the language and the apology, like the way that he went about communicating this was just so well done. And basically confronts the way that we perceive the Bible, like what we expect from it. And he like kind of exposes that a lot of Christians have this idea or this notion that the Bible is a constitution. They relate to the Bible as if it's like a rule book and it's a manual and it's here to tell us how to live and to tell us what the truth is and who God is and what God said. And he's like, that's not what this book is. And but Rob is also hitting that hard. Like, that's not what this book is. That's not what the authors intended. That's not where they were coming from. That's not what this is supposed to be for us, which was a lot to learn at first, right? Um, but in that process, I was like realizing I have to confront what the Bible is. And I, I could see that in the far off distance in the process. And I just didn't want to move toward it. I wasn't ready. I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I have the energy or the wherewithal to want to wade through all of the drama and the arguments. I was thinking specifically about having to relate to church leaders in that space because I was still submitted to leadership at that time, you know, and still trying to make it work within the church world. And, oh, um, but then, like, that summer, George Floyd was murdered, right? And there was this whole big thing in our country. I was in Reading. I was at Bethel when this happened. And there was, like, a pretty devi divisive, like, polarizing conversation around race and Black Lives Matter at that time. And I remember being shocked. Like, that was a pretty, like, eventful moment in the midst of this pandemic, right? And I remember stepping away from social media for, I didn't create anything new for, like, seven days. I, like, walked away. I had to stop. Um, I think some stuff posted automatically, but I made that stop too. I like connected with my manager, my social media manager. I was like, hey, let's freeze for now. Like, let's step away from this. And I just took seven days. I didn't mean for it to be seven. It just, that, that was how much, that's how long it took for me to figure out where I was in all this. And I was like, am I racist? Am I missing something? Why do I hear conviction and attitudes and beliefs and passions from people I respect and care about that I don't relate to, that I don't identify with? I don't feel spurned by this. But then I also like see other people that I respect and like value who are dismissing this. And there's like, there's obviously a disconnect. I was like, well, I don't even know where I fall between this. So I just did a bunch of research and like, kind of like how I'd approach the queer thing. I, not with the books, but like just went to town on YouTube, uh, social media, documentaries, just like consuming all kinds of new ideas that I'd never really prioritized or paid attention to like that. Um, I watched, I think it's called 13th which is about the 13th Amendment Amendment on Netflix. And it was that film through that process that finally broke me. I started crying and just like realized how detached and maybe cold, separated from specifically black people's experiences in America I had been. I was just like sobering up and realizing like I have been removed and I, you know, have been ignorant here because of my, my privilege as like being white passing, right? And like not having to care, like I didn't need to, it wasn't a requirement. And I even had a black person on my team. I had a single black woman on my team, but like I had to like connect with her again. We had already talked about George Floyd and whatever, but like we were both in a process and on a journey. The thing though is like being at Bethel, it was a very whitewashed environment and culture. And I don't, white supremacy is gonna sound really strong and intense, but I don't think it's inappropriate. Um, in the values that Bethel upholds and protects. Um, not, I don't mean just necessarily the messaging. I mean like the attitude of the culture, the expectations, the way that leaders relate to, anyway. Uh, so that was like a mess and that spurned me forward. And I started realizing in this process that made me, like compelled me to go further down the deconstruction journey that evangelical culture 
wasn't just harmful to gay people, which is where I started out, right? It was harmful to queer people at large, right? Like not just gay men. It was harmful to lesbians, to bisexuals, to transgender people, like and all, whatever. Anybody in the alphabet mafia, like it was harmful to all of us. But it wasn't just queer people. Evangelical culture, like Christian fundamentalism was harmful to people of color and minorities. It was harmful to women. It was silencing and marginalizing. Like there, it was just like, this is not just about me. Like there, there aren't just problems for me. There are problems in other areas too. And I've been uninformed there as well. And I've not needed to care because I'm not a woman or I'm not black or I'm not whatever, right? But now that I'm gay and I'm realizing that I'm being like dehumanized, <laughs> I can't see how other people are also being harmed and have been harmed this whole time and ignore that, right? So I just kept going and started reading more and more books and finding these authors and their voices and connecting with them and getting to like become friends with a lot of them, which I'm really thankful for and just getting deeper into this whole process. And I discovered somewhere along the way, and this is another piece that I just really, I haven't really talked about. Hi, Mike here. I just wanna make sure you know that I'm a coach and a consultant. I specifically work with people through their queer journey or their religious baggage. And there's a link below this episode if you wanna work with me. All right, let's get back to the episode. Politics became a very necessary thing to confront in the midst of this process. And I had spent a lot of energy and time avoiding politics entirely. I didn't care. I, I didn't want to care. I didn't want to engage. People would get so intense and so aggressive and belligerent in the political commentaries. And anybody I saw who cared about this stuff would get so barbed in like fangy and stabby. And I'm like, oh, I didn't respect it at all. And I just didn't want to be one of those people. I didn't want to participate. So I avoided it. And again, that's my privilege showing, right? I didn't have to care until I did. And so anyway, in this process, you start realizing that a lot of the things that people who are doing this kind of work are confronting is stuff that the right wing conservative party in America espouses and promotes and protects and perpetuates. And I'm coming from that right wing conservative world. My family, Bethel, like the churches, every church I've been part of was always a conservative, probably majority Republican community. Uh, and so you don't hear Republican or red, you know, as these values are being instilled, they're actually being in, instilled in you through the Bible, through preaching and sermons on Sundays. You're not just being taught theology or like biblical studies or even about the life of Jesus necessarily. You're being taught, I'm going to put it in this package, right wing conservative values disguised as Christianity. Uh, and so in this process of deconstruction, a lot of what I had to be confronted and what I had to face was the quote unquote politics and the values I was taught about how to perceive the economy, how to perceive victims, how to perceive homeless people, how to perceive minority identity, right? Like marginalized identities. Like these things had all been troped and tokenized and dehumanized and like politicized. And then we were told how Jesus or how the Bible or how scripture or what a biblical response to all these ideas was. And all of it was right wing conservative leaning, right? So that was really awkward to have to figure out without anybody straight up telling me that. And I'm over here like trying to lead my team and help them through their journey of just like recognizing that queer people are human and that they're valid in the eyes of God and they're blessed and to be affirmed and celebrated. We're doing that. And I'm over here like, oh God, because I never talked about politics with my team as much. I mean, I didn't, I tried not to, and I think that I didn't for the most part. There were moments. Oh, anyway, so in that process, that was also really clunky for me personally, and then I think also for the people around me, and it just kind of sifted and sorted, and it still just like kind of brought some divisive things that we had to face. And so I had some conservative people in my group, my team, and then some people who were already leaning more liberal, more progressive. And then obviously the more down this road I went, the more liberal slash progressive leaning I became. Not because I had to be anti-Trump, anti-Republican, even though I obviously saw huge problems there, but because I was like looking at the words of Jesus, looking at the values that I'd seen in the Bible, but then especially as a marginalized identity in my culture, I'm like, oh, hang on, power dynamics, um, equity, justice, when we're actually looking at victims in the midst of all these systems that are in place, this is not just some clean, sterile conversation that's just an intellectual, that's intellectual in nature. There are experiences, there is actual harm. There are people's lived experiences that tell us a story that isn't showing up in the sermons at church, at least the ones that I was raised in. And so that was a rude awakening that forced my intellectual process to have to go deeper, deeper. And I'm not even anywhere near done. I'm still learning. I'm still like pushing into becoming more informed around other types of people that aren't like me and how they are affected by this stuff. And, you know, 
if I'm preaching any kind of a message, is that message humanizing and acknowledging the people on the fringe, on the outskirts of the quote unquote majority, and are they benefiting? Is this quote unquote good news to those people? You know, and that became like a new standard. It was no longer did my pastor, did my denomination, did my church community affirm these values? It shifted from that to do my beliefs, do my values create harm? Do they create victims in the world? If that's the case, then my beliefs have to change. People are worth me doing that work, right? Because, and I got there because I needed that from people. I was like, I matter more than your theology. I need to be seen and heard and loved and valued and embraced and accepted by you over your theology. And I watched person after person in my coming out process choose their theology over my humanity, over my well-being, over a relationship with me. It was sickening. It was so dehumanizing and disheartening and repulsive. And I think that was another factor that also in a negative way propelled me into the deconstruction journey. I was like, ew, what I'm seeing in the church and Christian community I came from is nasty. Like this is not Jesus. This is not love. This is not justice. This is not goodness. This is not mercy. This is not humility. This is not excellence. This is not honor. It's like the opposite of this stuff. Um, and so with all these different com like contributing factors, I just kind of experience a momentum and that just kept building. And the more you informed you become, right? The more aware you become, the more your consciousness expands around the scope of human experience, the less the evangelical right-wing conservative identity and world makes sense. The less you can fit into it, the less you can justify and compromise for it anymore. Like it doesn't make sense. And so when you start confronting this stuff, you start, you see, excuse me, you see the people come out of the woodwork. <laughs> like, and they don't just like, Flash, they snarl and like stab and swipe and get huge and so aggressive and vindictive and accusatory and verbose. And it's shocking, it's shocking. And that just kept happening. And it, again, like it just, there was this whole push. Like I was being expelled from that world. The moment I confronted or said no, I remember there was something going on while I was early in Tennessee, uh, Roe versus Wade got overturned. And I, had been quote unquote pro-life my whole life, even though I never really like thought about it. I never like went too far into that. I didn't have to again, right? Like it wasn't. So anyway, when that happened, I was like, oh, I actually don't feel awesome about the government stepping in and telling women what they can or cannot do with their bodies and making choices around their own health. Like that to me is like an overreach and concerning. And I don't love the idea of aborting babies, right? But it's not as simple and as black and white as that, right? There was more going on. There were more driving forces behind this conversation. And the more I listen to the left side of this and people who are pro-choice, the more I'm like, these people are not saying, well, let's just kill all the babies. That wasn't where they were coming from. And I've never been able to hear them say anything other than that, right? I mean, everything that liberals had said, everyone from the left that was presented to me was always through a right wing filter. And so like they were evil and like of the devil and trying to murder babies. And this is the biggest genocide going on in our country. And you know, like it just gets these crazy spins. And so to all of a sudden, all of a sudden see this stuff from the other side, it was like, Oh my God, I've been living in like a, a bubble. I've been living in the matrix, like just consuming the programming they've been giving me my whole life, not thinking for myself, not actually listening to the women with uterus, the people with uteruses giving birth to babies and what they were saying and the horror stories that they've experienced and the way the healthcare system affected that whole experience for them. And like, that was a whole other world that I never heard about. That was never like actually like considered in the world I came from that I was aware of, you know? And most of this is a commentary of my own like values and perspective in the environment I was raised in, but a lot of it was informed by political bent, you know? And people use the Bible to drive how just and valid and authoritative their opinions around politics and people's freedoms in the world were. Like, it was a rude awakening. So all that to say, um, we're over here like, bar like arguing around like sin and forgiveness and Jesus, please come save me. And I'm like, what are we talking about? Um, right? Like we've got actual issues in people's lives and we're the world I was raised in is trying to ignore and erase that stuff and continue to center ourselves and our guilt and our shame and Jesus cleanse me, Jesus save me, Jesus accept me, let me worship you, let me experience that emotional high, let me just finally get off, like unburden myself and just keep doing this. 
And it was like, this is not a religion I care about. This is not a faith practice I value. I'm seeing too many, too much blindness and too many victims from this space, myself being one of them, that I'm like, something is deeply wrong. And so all that to say, like, then I started confronting, like, okay, what's the deal with hell? What's the deal with hell? What's the deal with sin? What's the deal with, uh, you know, um, eternal conscious torment and substitution, substitutionary atonement theory and, you know, pulling apart like these things I've been told that were gospel truth my whole life and realizing there were so many other academics and scholars who vehemently disagree with these ideas. And it's like, what? There's not one way to read this book. This is wild. And it's not because we just like choose the interpretation, interpretation that we like. It's like, oh, there are things that are motivating why we interpret the words of the Bible and Jesus especially the way that we do. And Jesus explicitly confronted the empire, right? Like, condemned Rome and the religious system at the time, continued to defend and take up the cause of the oppressed, of the poor, of women, of the, the foreigner, of the unclean, you know, the people who were like looked down upon in society. Jesus continued to advocate for them, humanize them, prioritize and choose them. He chose their side. And then when I look at what the evangelical church is doing and how it participates, especially on a political level in our country, it's like... Why is the name Jesus even coming up? You don't care about what Jesus has to say or how Jesus showed up. Like, this isn't about Jesus. Jesus has become clickbait at this point, right? Jesus is a scapegoat. Jesus is a mascot. Jesus is like a voodoo doll. This isn't about Jesus. We are using Jesus to promote white life. I is like, you know, what all this started looking like pretty clearly after a while. When you start listening to people who aren't white, <laughs> who aren't straight, who aren't pastors, who aren't like running the church world, like the story is different out here. So that was like a big major contributing factor to this process that I'm still unpacking and still having to like work through. Like what happened? Um, all the while following my conviction and following my heart, you know, and what I know to be true in like responding to the pain and the marginalization of my own queer experience. Like that was super helpful in providing clarity. And I actually kind of feel bad for people who don't have that going for them. Like the straight white community, like it's, it's more work I'm assuming for them to have to figure this stuff out because they don't have the conviction because they've been privileged their whole life and not had to like face some of this on a visceral level. And I'm not trying to dismiss white people of like difficulty or having their own experiences that they have to work through, right? We're all human, we have struggles and suffering we have to work through, but being a gay person in a church world, especially like being half Japanese, that's another factor that I'm not even getting into, but like there were actual victimizing beliefs that were turning me into less than human that I put up with and embraced for years of my life. And so to recognize so clearly, oh, this is wrong and this is producing really bad stuff in me and in people was such a helpful backstop to recognize when a thought process goes to a certain point and starts to push past that backstop, I know I have to say no. And I think some people don't have that backstop because it's not their experience. And they are actually benefited from and they are privileged within the system that exists currently that is deeply problematic for a lot of other people. What are we talking about? Anyway, so my deconstruction journey like kind of skyrocketed from that space and it, I just felt this strong compulsion to have to d dive deeper and pull more things apart further than I imagined I would go because I cannot uphold the beliefs and values that are gonna marginalize and victimize people, dehumanize people, that cannot, it can't, I can't have beliefs that create harm in the world anymore. Like that can't happen. Um, so anyway, uh, I have found a lot of great people who are saying a lot of things that I'm like, yes, no, exactly, oh my gosh, that's so true, say that louder. And so I wanna share some of them with you. So I'm gonna, for the rest of this series, share some other voices that I think do a great job on their platforms, but then I think also with the conversation that we had, you get to hear their story and where they came from and why. And I'm very excited to share all that with you. Thank you for being here with me. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sticking around. Those of you who are new, welcome. We got some work to do. All right, I'll see you in the next episode. Thank you for watching. As always, the pertinent links from the episode are below. I also have coaching and consulting available for you, as well as facilitated groups you might be interested in. You can find information about any of that with the first link below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.